Yeah, go for it. Okay. Uh, welcome, my friends, to uh, this, I guess this is the uh, third session of our uh, technician class. And uh, I'm probably going to uh, talk for uh, an hour or less on uh, the previous lesson and, you know, finish it up. Then uh, Bob will have something a little more uh, thrilling. I'll get you up in the sky. And uh, I'll talk about propagation and frequencies and all that sort of good stuff. Okay. Uh, yeah. Wow. We. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the thing is, uh, a lot of stuff is going uh, farther and farther uh, up, higher in frequency. Uh, like, uh, you know, the gigahertz range, you know, the ra radar ranges that are. Uh, microwave ovens operate on uh, 2450 or 2.45 uh, gigahertz. Our uh, cell phones and uh, routers, I think, go all the way up to uh, uh, 5.8 gigahertz. And uh, now this thing I'm subscribing to, uh, you know, Carlotta probably knows about it, uh, uh, the old Crows, uh, military uh, uh, or uh, electronic warfare. And uh, they're going even uh, even higher. So uh, anyway, all right. Uh, the first question first question I have is: uh, Does anyone have a question about uh, what was talked about last week, uh, or are, are you all experts on this? And uh, can I start I, quizzing you and all that? I actually missed last week, uh, Jerry, but I did. Uh, I was trying to find the recordings. I know you guys said that was on a YouTube channel. Yeah. Okay. But I did not. Uh, not able to... I'll I'll, uh, I'll write it in. It's um, okay. Um... All right. Can everyone see this? On chat, uh, where to go? Yes. Yeah, you you have to click on chat and it'll pop up on your on your right. So yeah, YouTube Jerry's W nine NPI channel. Yep, and uh, it'll it'll be there. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oops. Okay, let me get out of this and uh, get back to. Uh, uh, share screen and all that sort of stuff. Okay. Uh, we were talking about uh, the very various uh, uh, the uh, various laws, Ohm's law for uh, and the power law, and how this is a uh, th thing that you write down in your scratch paper the minute you uh, uh, get it, and. Uh, then all you have to do is, uh, for the value you want, E is voltage, I is current, and R is uh, resistance. If you want to know the resistance and you're given the voltage and current, then all you have to do is divide the voltage by the current and here's your resistance. Uh, power is about a, a little different. Power, current, and voltage. So uh, that'll give you your... Uh, your value in watts. And of course, uh, named after uh, James Watt, the inventor of the steam engine, <laughs> and then other things. Okay, so um, I I didn't uh, go through too many of these. You, you, the quizzes will have all these uh, you know, different uh, exercises. Uh, for the exam, uh, you can work all this stuff up uh, just by using pencil and paper. You don't even have to take your shoes off. Okay. Um, any questions on that yet? Okay. We're talking about different kinds of components. And uh, all right. Resistors, capacitors, inductors, these are things that uh, uh, do things with electricity. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little more uh, on that just to, as a uh, sort of review. 
A resistor opposes the flow of electric current in either an AC or DC circuit. And uh, these are electronic resistors. Uh, if you want to see a uh, something a little more physical, you can uh, go to your stove. And if you have an electric stove, the element is one big resistor. And it resists the uh, 220 volts that's uh, going through it. And uh, in resisting it, it's uh, creating a lot of heat. And uh, you use that heat. And uh, same thing with the light bulb. Uh, the light bulb, well, the old incandescent uh, light bulb had a bunch of highly resisted wire in it that would get very hot and start glowing. And you use the glow to illuminate things. Of course, nowadays we are uh, going into uh, semiconductors, which we'll uh, get into in, in a minute. And uh, they convert electricity dire directly into light. That is a uh, marvelous thing. All right, I think we talked about uh, capacitors a little bit. A uh, major thing that they do is that they store electrical energy. They store DC energy, direct current energy. Uh, does anyone remember the difference between uh, alternating current and direct current? Silence is deafening. Okay. Major source of direct current is what? Batteries. <laughs> Batteries, yes. And the voltage is stable. It stays the same, doesn't vary at all. Uh, because of uh, a big fight that Edison and Westinghouse had uh, back in the uh, late 1800s, our Commercial electricity is usually alternating current. It's got a lot of uh, pluses to it, but the uh, problem is it's uh, it keeps going up and down, up and to zero, then down and to zero and up and down, and uh, uh, just goes you know re 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 like a sine wave. Now, one, one thing that it stores direct current, but it will allow alternating current to pass through. And uh, that, that's an important thing because uh, we can hook a microphone and the output of the microphone can go through a capacitor. But if we hook a battery and try to get the uh, electricity to go through it, it won't go. Okay. Inductors or coils take electricity and create a magnetic field. When the electric when the electricity or flow of electrons stops, the magnetic field collapses, and when the magnetic field collapses, it creates a flow of current. So it's sort and that uh, that collapse also kind of resists the flow of alternating current. So uh, these things will pass direct current because we're we're just going through coils, but because of the magnetic field, it will uh, oppose alternating current. Now, when you put two of these things together, a, a capacitor and a uh, coil, at some frequency. Now the capacitor will uh, allow alternating current to flow through and the coil, well, we're talking about uh, the reactance of the coil. The, the coil will uh, eventually show very, 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 very uh, small reactance. When uh, the reactances cancel each other out and uh, become sort of like zero, it's called resonance. Now, this is a very good thing uh, because, uh, well, I'm, I'm living in the middle of a uh, 
an antenna farm. All the broadcast stations uh, uh, were uh, established here back in the uh, 40s and 50s in, in Oak Park, Michigan. And uh, they thought that was uh, as far out as anyone would want to get and uh, still be in Detroit. So uh, in the meantime, I have all these uh, all these stations and they're causing all sorts of uh, radiations, which interfere actually with my uh, uh, re receiving FM radio and some TV. So if I want to say uh, WWJ, which is not too far from me, if I want to block off or uh, reduce the power that's uh, shoving into my receiver, I can build a coil and capacitor arrangement which will take that particular frequency and put it down to uh, put it down to ground, put it down to zero, ground it out. So it'll uh, that that way I can uh, hear other frequencies, or hear other stations. Okay, more resistors. These are called uh, what? They have adjustments. Adjustable resistors, they're called what? Pots, potentiometers. Potentiometers, yes, they have the potential, yes. And uh, since a capacitor is just two conductors separated by an insulator, uh, you, you see these little guys, and uh, you can see that... Uh, I, I can see the metal, but uh, what, what's the insulator? Dielectric. What's the dielectric in, the, in this thing? I, I I don't I don't see any uh, air. Air. Okay. Good old. Uh, I think uh, Willow Marconi, in one of his uh, huge stations back in uh, the 1900s, had a whole room of uh, sheets of metal with air gaps for a large capacitor. Uh, these guys use a, uh, a piece of mica and a little screw adjustment. Okay. All right, we talked a little bit about uh, diodes and transist diodes, transistors. Okay, let's, all right, first of all, diodes sort of look like resistors, except uh, most of them have a stripe on one end. The two parts of the diode are a, uh, the cathode and the anode. And what, what a diode does is what? Passes current in one direction. You got it. Now, some of the some of these things have color codes, and uh, you know, if you can uh, look up, say, the uh, amateur radio handbook, they would have uh, all the all the values so you could uh, tell what the uh, what the number of the uh, diode is. Uh, some of them are very tiny mm -hmm. glass beads, and others, like this one, is uh, used in a power supply, and uh, as is this. Now, these things are uh, mostly made out of sand, quartz, or or, or silicon, and uh, there are little spots uh, in the in the silicon where uh, some uh, other exotic stuff. I'm thinking of uh, one thing is arsenic and cyanide, so you, you don't want to start eating transistors, but uh, at those junctions. They also act sort of like uh, diodes. There are three leads. Two of the leads will pass current through. And the third lead, actually, if you uh, put a charge on it in the right way, it will control the amount of current that uh, this uh, transistor will, uh, will pass. So it's almost like you're, uh, you know, you have the, you have your, uh, nozzle on your hose and you uh you're trying to uh trying to hit your uh, running kid it's a hot summer day so sometimes you have to uh 
give a little more oomph. Other times you have to uh, ease up. So uh, that, that's what pretty much what you do. You can uh, you can uh, attach a microphone circuit to this thing, and it will uh, actually cause a large uh, larger amount of uh, current from a very small microphone uh, uh, control current. So what this thing will do will boost up the output. And that's called amplification. Uh, these are uh, uh, common power uh, transistors. And uh, can you tell me, well, you can see here, there's a piece of metal here, piece of all metal. Uh, this one has a, a, a screw hole. Uh, what do you think that uh, they, they'd be used for? Well, when you uh, get your uh, handy talkie or mobile, you'll see that these transistors heat up when uh, power goes through. So uh, it's a good thing to attach these to a larger piece of metal that would absorb heat, or it's called a heat sink. Okay, there are two, two types of transistors. One is called a bipolar, and uh, well, let's see, where's where's our uh, where's our diagram? Uh, hang on a sec. Um, oh, don't they have it here? I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. And Um, right there. Um, okay, give me a second. Um, technician. Okay, here it is. Okay, two types of transistors. Uh, these are schematic diagrams, as uh, you can see. Uh, it's not an actual picture, it's sort of an actual what they do. And here you have, for a bipolar transistor, you have the emitter, base, and collector. The emitter and uh, collector allow the current to pass or pass the current through, and the base is the thing that controls the uh, the flow. Uh, with the uh, different types of field FETs or field effect uh, transistors, you have a source and a drain. It passes the uh, current through, and the gate is the uh, controller. Don't have to do too much in the way of uh, details on this thing, just so uh, just so you know those terms: emitter, base, and collector, and source, drain, and gate. Okay, clear for everybody. Okay, let's um, share. 
share again. Okay. All right, fuses. Uh, fuse is uh, actually a uh, sacrificial uh, type of thing. And, you know, it sacrifices your life, uh, it, its life for your safety. Uh, here are a couple of uh, ones that you are used in electronics. Uh, these are cartridge fuses. And uh, these are uh, automotive type fuses. And they're uh, common in one thing. They have a fine wire that goes through them. And if too much current flows through, it melts the wire and uh, stops the uh, flow of current. So uh, easy as that. I uh, know some of them are, uh, well, this one is a, uh, a regular fuse or slow blow flight type fuse. Uh, if there's if there's a um, a motor starting or something that sort of draws a lot of current at first and then uh, eases off, then uh, a slow blow uh, fuse will take that into account. It won't uh, kill itself at the at the uh, very outset. Uh, this one, it, it, there's a little spring in there, so uh, it's called a quick action uh, fuse. And uh, with the spring there, it's uh, it will blow faster. That's for more sensitive equipment. And uh, now this one, the I guess they don't want uh, the heat from the uh, fused wire blowing the glass or something of that sort. So it's uh, you can't see what's in it. And uh, right in here, if you look carefully, you'll see a little U of uh, of the, the wire that's going to melt. Uh, it used to be, and uh, actually it was uh, only uh, two years ago that I switched my house over to from uh, those uh, screw in fuses to uh, circuit breakers. But I uh, usually had the tradition, if you uh, ran out of fuses, all you had to do would uh, be to uh, put a penny in the fuse holder and you know, screw the, the old fuse in there and uh, it would uh, allow any amount of current to pass. Good idea, huh? Save you money. Of course, it would also, uh, uh, since, since the penny will uh, pass so much current, it would uh, pass more current than the wires uh, to your circuit could handle. And uh, uh, house fires have started. Yikes. Yeah. I don't know if you... Uh, saw that movie Christmas Story where the old man uh, was plugging into the Christmas tree and he had about <laughs> five or six uh, five or six things uh, out of one socket and uh, anything he touched blew. <laughs> okay. Ground fault circuit interrupter. You'll uh, probably see it in the kitchen and bathroom now. Um Let's go back to that. Uh, where's my uh, where's my schematic? Okay. All right. Um, That's down there with the circuit interrupters? Yeah. In the bottom? Yeah. Well, it's, let me see. No, it doesn't really have the uh, uh, ground fault uh, interrupter there. But uh, you can you can take a look. Uh, can, you, can you see this uh, diagram, the schematics? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Somewhat, yeah. they're slightly small. Can you enlarge it just a bit? Uh, let, okay, let me see. I'll stop sharing that. And uh, let me uh, start sharing again.
and that's that's much better. Okay. Yeah, that's a little better. Thank you. Yeah, I, I turned it. I uh, made a, a JPEG of the thing. Uh, and that's what I'm showing you. Okay. To understand the ground fault circuit interrupter, I have to know about uh, the kind of AC wiring that we uh, we have. Uh, nowadays, we use you know three terminals. You know, almost looks like uh, you know, a face with a little open mouth. And uh, the small blade contact is the hot one. That's the dangerous one. The neutral also go also goes back to the to the fuse box, and the ground should go to the fuse box. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. Anyway, a ground fault circuit interrupter will check to see whether there's a voltage potential between the neutral and the ground. And uh, if there is, it will uh, it will uh, trip the, uh, it'll, it'll uh, close, uh, sorry, open the contact. It'll open up the uh, circuit so you can't, uh, can't use it. it. Means that uh, if you're touching ground, if you're touching neutral or ground, you might uh, get a shock. So uh, that's what it's for. It's a uh, fairly recent uh, requirement, I think, in the uh, electrical code, but uh, it's, it's a good thing. Okay, um, diodes. Let's go back to diodes. Is uh, not only do they rectify this? This one is the Rectifier just uh, changes the alternating current into one direction, direct current, pulsating direct current. But you have uh, several others, uh, like this one. You see the two arrows going out. That's a light emitting diode that converts electricity into light photons. And uh, we use that now for uh, uh, monitor lights, pilot lights, all, all sorts of good things. If the arrows are facing, going in the other direction, that's uh, that's actually detecting light, and it, it will uh, it will conduct electricity. It's almost like a transistor using light as the uh, as the way to uh, as the way to uh, complete the circuit. Uh, two other types of diodes. Let's see, we don't get into shot keys uh, very much, but a, uh, a Zener diode is something uh, we'll, we'll show you a little later in the, uh, in the circuit, uh, circuit reading. The Zener diode acts like a resistor if you have it on a power supply, the Zener diode is usually uh, has a rating of uh, volts, five volt, nine volts, 12 volts, 100 volts, whatever. But if you have a 12 volt power supply and uh, there's uh, some sort of pulse or something of that sort and the uh, 12 volts goes up to uh, 13 or 14 volts, the Zener diode will act as a resistor and try to uh, bring that uh, 14 volts down to 12 volts again. Okay, anything else? Um, all right, uh, switches. Click, click, single pull, and there's only one circuit here, a single throw. So this is your light switch. This is your on-off switch. Sometimes you have two things to switch. So you have two switches. That's called a double pole single throw. Only goes one way. 
single pull, double throw. You can select where it goes. I used to use uh, something like this as a uh, way to switch my transmitter and receiver to an, a single antenna. The antenna's here, receiver here, and then I pull a switch and transmit. Same thing, double pull, two poles. They're not connected to each other, but they accept mechanically. And you have uh, you know, two selections. You want to spiff it up. You uh, attach a uh, an electromagnet to it. And uh, this is, well, the electromagnet uh, scheme you can see in your car every day. Every time you uh, close your uh, car door, the uh, the locks uh, go on, and that's just an electromagnetic magnet that's pulling a piece of metal that's uh, closing your lock. You attach that to a switch, and it's called a relay. Here's a single pull, single throw. Here's one pull. When the relay is turned on. Click. This one, when the relay is turned on, you can, well, when it's, when it's uh, off, it's attached to one pole. When it's on, it flips to the other pole. They used to have the, a lot of those in police cars when they were, uh, when they were switching uh, from transmitter to receiver. <laughs> but uh, I'm, uh, I'm betraying my age by that. Okay. <laughs> Any any questions there? All right. When I was uh, running my kids' class, I did the uh, the standard potato battery, and then I opened up a uh, nine volt uh, mini battery, and I saw that there were six of these. It's almost like a potato battery. It had uh, you know the uh, uh, dissimilar metal and had uh, had the electrolyte. It had uh, six of those, and six times one point five equals nine volts. Single cell, multiple cells. All right, we talked about uh, grounds. Uh, this is pounded in, into the ground, or I guess. Uh, until they started uh, substituting plastic pipe. We used to use, uh, use a copper pipe or uh, uh, iron pipe ground uh, from a water system. All right, so I think they'll ask you about chassis grounds. I don't think they're going to ask you about common grounds. Okay. Oh, and uh, here, this thing will have a symbol in it. There are two, usually, well, two leads. Two leads will, will come out of this. And the label, if it's A, V, I, it'll tell you what it's measuring. Current or uh, current in amperes or um, fractions of amperes, Vs for voltage. Okay. And uh, symbol for an antenna. Okay, anything else? Okay. All right, let me get back to uh, whatever else. Okay, uh, a little bit about radios. Okay, you can see this guy. And uh, Mike, this is the one for you. It's a contesting transceiver. Yeah, you, you're doing a contest. You don't want to leave your seat for any reason. 
So not only does this have a uh, very high class transmitter receiver or all the way up to, from uh, 160 meters all to six meters, but it has a coffee maker, a microwave oven, and a refrigerator. <laughs> and it comes with a box of depends. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. I don't. I don't know how the, uh, those those guys who used to uh, uh, fly the B fifty twos and B thirty six uh, bombers, uh, how they uh, could manage these uh, eighteen hour trips. But uh, I'm I'm not going to ask. Anyway. That's uh, that's a it's a joke. It's uh, it doesn't exist. Although I I'm sure there are people who uh, who uh, love it to be to exist. Okay, let me uh, get rid of some of this stuff now. Um, Now, let's see if there's anything else. Um, all right. Um, it's a full screen. And okay, something that uh, they might talk about, I still have it here. Okay, they're going to have a couple of questions about uh, mixing. Uh, it used to be called heterodyning. Uh, what, what it means is that you can have two, two types of signals, and if you will put them together, you'll mix them together. Uh, the easiest way, and uh, I know back in the, uh, about 1905 or thereabouts, someone actually did it. Uh, they took a, uh, a transmitted signal that uh, was only used for uh, you know, sending Morse code, turning on and off. And uh, the guy managed to uh, put a microphone in it. So he mixed the voice signal, and actually uh, his violin signal as well, with the radio signal, and came out with what was called a modulated signal, which... Uh, uh, people back there then with their uh, crystal sets would be able to uh, listen to. Uh, in 1905, there were very few uh, radio operators out there, and they were very surprised when they heard that. It wasn't until the 1920s that uh, you actually had uh, commercial radio broadcasting going. But um, anyway, uh, we there was uh, something called a transverter, which uh, you know, before the advent of a whole bunch of uh, new radios that had uh, all that stuff built in, you could take an existing radio that would operate on uh, 10 meters or 28 megahertz, mix it with a an oscillator that was going at 116 megahertz. So 116 plus 28 equals 144 megahertz, which is output on the uh, two meter band. Now, uh, when you mix something, you have both the both the positive and negative. You have the uh, two frequencies that are added, which is good, and you have two frequencies that are subtracted, and you have output on uh, on that. So. You have uh, both 144 megahertz going out and 88 megahertz uh, going out. So that 
you don't want the 88 megahertz because you're not licensed and it's uh, just a spurious inter interference. So what you have to do is uh, put a series of filters in, uh, usually coils and capacitors and things to uh, make sure that this gets grounded and only this gets out. And it goes in the other direction as well, because uh, let's see, can I get this to work? No. Jerry, question? Sure. Um, you have the 28 megahertz and the 116 megahertz and collectively and together they equal the 144. Where yeah. in the mathematics uh, did the 88 come from, which was bad? Hang on. That was just the 116 minus the 28. Yeah. I see. So you add and or subtract one from the other. Is there yes. a sequence of which one? Is it just the lower one you have to subtract from the higher one? Uh, well, you, you have to come up with a uh, positive number. Okay, I see. Okay. 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 So, well, that, that, that goes in that direction. And uh, let's see if I can and uh, of course it goes in the other direction too you can receive a signal at 144 megahertz mix it in with 116 and this time you go with the minus and that goes into your 10 meter radio now they they used to make these things uh i don't think they sell them anymore uh do you think uh, mike transferters No, I don't think so. I'm, I haven't yeah. seen them in years. You know, they I've used never to have seen one. Yeah, they they used to have uh, one that you could buy for your car if you had an AM only radio that would convert to uh, FM. Yeah, actually, I have uh, something from uh, one of my cousins uh, that I uh, will probably want to sell. It uh, actually converts uh, AM radio into uh, shortwave. So uh, it's uh, you know some of that stuff still exists, but it's uh, getting more and more obsolete. Okay, let's see. Oh, here here's you now the uh, the scheme that we had using those switches. I remember uh, well, when I first started, I had a separate transmitter and a separate receiver, and I have this uh, big knife switch that I. Uh, got from a uh, Frankenstein movie <laughs> and I would switch between the transmitter and receiver with it until uh, my father brought some a, uh, a big relay from uh, from his work and I was able to use that to, to switch. Okay. All right, oscillator. This, this is a circuit. Here's a uh, component that you won't have to know about, but it's called a crystal. And uh, sometimes you'll see uh, uh, piezoelectric, uh, piezo speakers and things of that sort. It means that uh, there's a uh, piece of uh, quartz that uh, if, number one, if you uh, run a current through it, the piece of quartz will vibrate at a certain frequency. We used to have uh, these things that would plug in to control frequencies, uh, especially with novices. We weren't uh, trusted with you know, adjusting our own frequency. We had to put a, a crystal in. And uh, we'd have uh, dozens of crystals to go to different frequencies. What this does is uh, make a stable, a very, very stable, frequency that this thing will uh, transmit at. Uh, here's a transistor that's, uh, see the, the uh, crystal is attached to the base of the, uh, of the transistor, which means that this is vibrating and vibrating. It'll cause the output of this to vibrate. And the vibrating frequency, vibrating uh, signal will go through 
the capacitor, but the, the battery current, which is going through here, why won't it go through to the antenna? Why wouldn't the uh, direct current electricity go to the antenna? Well, we got any teacher's pets here? Because the capacitor blocks the direct current, but will let the alternating current cir circuit, this vibrating circuit, go through. We got that, anyone? Hey, Bob, can you hear me? Yep, gotcha. <laughs> Okay. So that's a variable capacitor. Is that what that is? Yeah. In this diagram? Yeah. And this is another kind of, kind of switch. Uh, usually has, you know, it has a, a nice handle on it. And uh, we call this a key. So uh, this is a simple continuous wave transmitter, a, a ham transmitter. And you can keep on tapping and it will uh, make the circuit go whenever you tap that uh, key and complete the circuit. Yep, yep, exactly. Yeah. I used to get uh, those things for uh, a quarter a piece in a big barrel. Uh, eBay's doing uh, 60 to $300 for them now. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's, it's, class, it's a classic, it's a classic piece. Okay, I think I've got just about everything I have to say right now. Uh, any final questions? Any last words? Bob, take it away. Well, okay. Okay, let me do that. Uh, oh. Okay, uh, Jerry, am I sharing? Yes. Okay, okay. I I tell you what, um, I'm going to take you into the subject that that is just my favorite subject of of all these in the ham radio license class uh, or the course. Not only in in the technician level, but also in the general level and the uh, extra level. And, and that topic is propagation. You know, years ago, and I mean many, many years ago when I was in the Army Reserve, uh, th this was back in the days when the, the Reserve Forces had one big mission, and that was to fight the Soviet Union when they started coming, you know, west through Europe. And anyhow, at that time, I had purchased a, an AM FM stereo with a cassette player uh, what used to be called a boombox, <laughs> you know, a, a fairly large shoulder model um, that I use as an entertainment center. Well, lo and behold, this very analog set, in addition to strip of frequencies for AM radio and FM radio, had two additional strips of frequencies, one titled SW1 and the other titled SW2. Yeah, they were shortwave frequencies. And, you know, being a curious sort, I started... Uh, you know, playing around on those, just seeing what was out there. And yes, the most significant thing for me at that time was hearing all these foreign stations. Now, at that time, there were lots of uh, countries that had broadcast stations. And, you know, from being in the Army Reserve, the one that I was interested in listening to was, yeah, Radio Moscow. Yeah, I wanted to hear what the enemy was saying about us. And all, also very prominent at that time was uh, Radio Havana. Uh, yeah, yeah, another commie station. Um, they're still on the air, by the way. Many others uh, have gone off. Now, I wasn't just listening to the enemy because back then on my shortwave radio, and this is, a, you know, the most basic, cheap, you know, kind of shortwave system available. Um, back then, and this was way before the Internet, you know, many nations, you know, use shortwave to get their message out all through the world. And, you know, for both goodwill and propaganda reasons. And there was like excellent programming on from Germany on Radio Deutsche Welle 
uh, Switzerland and Swiss Radio International, Canada, of course, Radio Canada International. There was this station from Ecuador, HCBJ, which uh, I, I think they were kind of a religious station, sort of. Um, and then, of course, from Spain, Radio Exterior de España, uh, as well as All India Radio, just to name a few. And I was just amazed, you know, at at this, you know, radio frequency propagation that, you know, I could hear, you know, sitting in uh, in Pontiac, Michigan, I could hear um, broadcasts from Europe, Asia, um, parts of Africa and uh, and uh, uh, the Middle East. Uh, and it, it just wowed me, you know, it's like, the, I don't have a strong um, science background, you know, my science background stopped with uh, high school chemistry. And this was just, I, it's, it's like magic to me. <laughs> you know, I just, I just really enjoy that. Okay, and so, uh, you know, at that point, I graduated to a better shortwave radio. And I was able to actually start hearing ham bands because the more expensive uh, shortwave radio allowed me to hear single sideband. And that's when I started hearing ham operators. And that's really what got me interested in, um, in ham radio. Uh, you know, propagation is just fascinating and it's constantly changing, you know, not just not just week to week, but even hour to hour. You know, last year there was this uh, um, this radio contest on the 10 meter band. And you people, when you get your technician license, you are going to have phone voice privileges on the 10 meter band. Anyhow, on the 10 meter band, I was contacting all kinds of stations in the South. You know, Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Interestingly enough, no Ohio, couldn't get Ohio. But then suddenly after hearing all these stations and talking with all these stations from the South, then all of a sudden, I started getting stations to the West. Something had changed in the propagation. Something had changed in the atmosphere that allowed us to, count, to go West. And this is on the 10 meter band, which is not normally a super long distance band. But all of a sudden I was hearing Kansas and Nebraska and Colorado and Utah out to the Santa Clarita Valley in California. <laughs> one, one station in, in Colorado, a, a guy who had been on, you know, on the radio that weekend a lot said, you know, it, it was like he had never heard from Michigan. And then all of a sudden he said within the last half hour, he had uh, he had more than a dozen contacts from Michigan. Fascinating stuff. This is made possible by, you know, radio waves, you know, traveling through the uh, through the atmosphere. Okay, and that's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit tonight. Okay. Um, before we do that, though, let me go back and just review a little bit of where did my Uh, uh, Jerry, am I sharing? Yes. Okay, so you can see the spectrum chart. Yep. Um, no, I, uh, I, I see all your uh, icons. You had oh. the uh, spectrum. Uh, no, I don't see a yeah. spectrum chart. You're, you're in your illustrations folder in documents. So you're showing your, you know. Okay, let me see what I got here. No. Hang on. I had this open before. No, it's Zoom. 
So yeah, he had it open uh, before. It should be somewhere around. Yeah. <laughs> Did he minimize it? There it is. There it is. Okay, as we as we start to talk about propagation, we're going to be referring to what well, we <laughs> I'm going to be referring to some stuff. And so I, I think at this point, I'd like to review just a little bit about the bands. Okay, now we talked uh, with chapter two, we talked about, you know, the HF band, the high frequency band, the very high frequency band VHF and ultra high frequency. Um, there's some things on this chart that I want you to remember going forward. And that is the HF band. We talked about that, that starts at three megahertz. And that's down near the 80 meter band. And remember, as, as the frequency increases, the wavelength gets shorter. Now, I've highlighted a couple of things here that I'd really kind of like you to remember, okay? Um, these uh, particular bands that I have highlighted, the 10 meter band, the six meter, the two meter, the 70 centimeter, these are all bands that technicians have voice privileges on. Um, on the 10 meter band, which is actually in high frequency, it's not VHF, uh, you can get some distance on that, okay? Now, remember the high frequency, uh, this is usually called a short wave, but it goes from three megahertz to 30 megahertz. Very high frequency goes from 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz. You see, we're just multiplying by 10 each time. And so the UHF band starts at 300 megahertz and goes up to three gigahertz, also known as 3000 megahertz. Again, you're multiplying by 10. Okay. The Bye. seven. That appears to be a great chart. Can you make it a little larger or is it in the book? Uh, it is in the book. Okay. Not not with my notes on it, but it is in the book. It's on page 2-4 in the book. Got it. Now, um, in terms of it being large, right now it's taking up most of the screen. So um, you may want to go to your... Oh. I'm following along in the book. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, depending on what view you have, if you... Thank you, I found it in the book. Okay. Yeah, but depending on what view you have, um, if if you're looking at a bunch of the um, the screen share part should be the majority of your screen, and you can do that. I think it's in the top right corner where where you select that. Any rate, so where were we? All right. Um, so when anyhow. When I'm talking about VHF, because propagation is different depending on your frequency, it changes with the frequency. So there are some areas where um, some conditions will affect high frequency, but not VHF. And there are some conditions that will affect VHF, but not UHF. For instance, for instance, let's talk about rain and fog. Rain and fog will have virtually no effect on high frequency, on 30 megahertz to 300, virtually none. It'll have very little effect on VHF. It'll have some effect, but, but on UHF, yeah, uh, rain and fog can you know, diminish your signal. Um, there's also differences in the characteristics of these. The very, very long wave communication comes in the HF band, which have longer wavelengths and lower frequencies. When you get up to the VHF band um, and the, uh, the principal, really the, the principal band uh, that uh, 
open to technicians is really the two meter band. That's that's the one that'll be the workhorse for you. And uh, that's basically line of sight communications. However, depending on some conditions, um, you can get several hundred miles. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, anyhow, so it would be good for you for your test to remember these things that are highlighted, okay? Three megahertz to 30 megahertz, 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz, and 300 megahertz to, I, I know the chart says three gigahertz, but I think the actual test question when they ask you about VHF says 300 megahertz to 3000 megahertz, I think. Okay. Uh. Is that all I wanted to say about that? I believe that is. Now, okay. Am I, Jerry? Am I sharing? Yes. Okay. And so you're seeing this refracting grid you've got I'm, I'm showing four different boxes yep okay <sighs> all right now the types of propagation we get and this one doesn't actually have a chart for direct line of sight <laughs> but you know for two meters and and uhf essentially your uh the distance you're going to achieve is usually going to be based on line of sight so you can get several miles but that's about it to get really really big differences really big distances you've got to start bouncing your signal off the ionosphere aha uh -huh. and there's a couple of ways that can happen, either with a single bounce off the uh, ionosphere, as in figure six here, where from one station, it goes up, bounces off the F, F layer, and then uh, reflects back to the Earth many, many miles away uh, to the receiving station, or as in uh, figure seven, the Earth will actually, not only will the ionosphere reflect radio waves, so will the Earth. So you can get a couple of different hops. Now in, in this, this shows, um, you know, you're getting essentially two hops. All right, so you're reflecting up off the atmosphere, and then it's being bent down to the, the um, radio wave is bent back down to the earth and then it bounces again and goes further. Okay. All uh, right. Bob, Bob, can I uh, make one comment? Yes. Uh, uh, right. Uh, sometimes when I'm uh, talking to a station, could be, uh, I know, halfway across the, the world, uh, I have charts that uh, show how to point my antenna. And uh, at times, you know, like I, I if I pointed at uh, uh, 33 degrees uh, you know, north uh, northwest. Uh, sometimes I get better results by pointing it in the exact opposite direction, and uh, it might take fewer bounces or more bounces or thereabouts. But uh, so sometimes uh, I can uh, get better results by pointing in the opposite direction and uh, still get the bounces. Okay, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, not only uh, can you at times uh, bounce off the uh, ionosphere or off our own atmosphere, but you can also bounce off. Um, if you're far enough north and can see the aurora borealis, you can you can bounce off the aurora now or also. Um, when meteors pass through, essentially they're passing through, I think the E layer, um, they leave a, an ionized trail. And that ionized trail can serve to 
uh, reflect radio waves also. Now, with both of those, you come up with some pretty um, <laughs> uh, pretty distorted signals. But, uh, you know, that's the way it goes. Um, let's see. All right, let yeah, me try that, this. That's a word. Let, let me try this. Uh, now, what I have here, okay, can you see that, Jerry? Yep. Okay, what I have here, um, I'm going to play you a transmission of uh, two guys bouncing their radio signal off the Aurora Borealis. Okay, now you're going to see, it, you're going to hear it. it's pretty. Um, it's it's somewhat distorted. Now, the, the really clear voice you're hearing, that's the guy whose radio we're listening to. So you hear him clearly. He's got a call sign, uh, Victor Echo, VE3 something. So that, he's Canadian. Uh, but then the people that he's getting uh, are uh, distant stations. Now, how do I... Sounds like the exorcist. <laughs> okay, QS five Y. That means he's going to change his frequency up um, five megahertz, and you'll see that here in a minute. Okay, so he went from 5125 to 5130. Now he's going to go again. Okay, so that's what the Aurora sounds like. Um, the uh, Victor Echo Station, that was Canadian. The Alpha Alpha Station was somewhere in the U.S. All right, so that's that. But now, Meteor Scatter is even more distorted. Here's what Meteor Scatter sounds like. Okay, I just wanted to give you a flavor there of, of what that sounds like. Um, okay, now what else? So Bob, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, now the illustrations you had, five, six, seven, and eight, I don't think those are in the book, but I'm kind of looking at... This no, they're not. They're from, they're actually from an old Navy manual, a okay. Navy electronics manual. Okay. What I'm trying to figure out is just that ionosphere. Can I compare it to the pictures in the book though? Like this, um, this one on page four, four, is that the F layer that you were talking about? Or it, like, where would the ionosphere rest or be situated on that one? Well, funny you should ask. It starts, it starts around 30 miles, doesn't it? 
Yeah, yes, it does. And uh, that's and, uh, that's around the D layer, isn't it? Which uh, which your uh, diagram, the the navy diagram doesn't show. Um, let's see if I can. Let me get rid of that. Oh damn it! Uh, let's stop sharing that. Let's share that. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, the ionosphere, um, yeah, the D layer starts about 30 miles up. You know, it's like down where we are, you know, up to about six miles, that's the troposphere. Uh, so, you know, and then, and then the stratosphere, and then, you know, from about six miles to about 30 miles, and then starting at 30 miles, that's where you hit the ionosphere. And the ionosphere is, um, you know, it goes from 30 to uh, a bit over 50 miles, or I'm sorry, <laughs> the ionosphere goes hundreds of miles, but um, the D layer starts at about 30 miles up and goes, you know, a bit over, over to over 50 miles up. Then you start into the E layer and the E layer is, you know, smaller after which you get into the F layer. Okay, and the F layer, you know, that kind of starts uh, about, what, 70 miles up and goes up to, uh, well, in this one, it, it goes up to a couple hundred miles. Okay. And so, Bob, ask, um, that E and F layer, they say that combines together at night to form just the F layer, is that correct? Yes. So it seems to be hard to bounce off of that F layer because it would have to be nighttime. No, the F, in the daytime, you have the F1 and the F2. Right. And, uh, which you can bounce off either. Mm -hmm. But um, when you get to the, uh, to the nighttime, then it's just a large, large single F layer. Right. And uh, highest layer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Kim, just to answer your question real quick, because uh, I got the book open now, um, that chart on 44, that bottom chart there, is exactly the the chart that he had up, only it's, you know, just a different. Yeah, I was, a, I was able to compare those. I was just trying to kind of get a frame of reference. So yeah. yep. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's take that down. Darn. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, hang on and let me try and share now this. Okay, how about that? That's nice. Oh yeah, that's a really good rep. Okay, uh, this this I think is also from an old Navy manual, but uh, this shows you how you know during the day you've got the D layer, the E layer, and then the F one and F two. Whereas you know you get to night and you notice the D layer is completely gone, the E layer well it's still there a little bit, but it's real faint and you know really weak. And then you see the F1 and F2, and they combine into a single, uh, you know, denser uh, layer, which is, uh, you know, it's from where the F1 layer was, and it goes up a little higher than that. So, yeah. You, you want to tell them why, why we don't like the D layer? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Um... Uh, you, you notice if you're uh, listening to AM radio during the day, uh, you can't get very much range. So almost line of sight, uh, you, you can't listen to, you can't hear flinch, you can't hear anything like that. That's because uh, this D layer kind of suppresses the bouncing. At night, when the D layer disappears, 
uh, I don't know, the truckers have, I think, three stations that cover the entire United States because uh, it bounces off uh, the ionosphere at that point and uh, uh, has a, a lot of skip, a lot of, uh, a lot of good range. So that, that's why that's why we don't like the D layer there very much, and uh, that's uh, D layer is uh, effective on uh, 160 meters. It's uh, 1.8 to do two megahertz, and uh, uh, 80 meters, 75, which is uh, 3.5 to four megahertz. Uh, after that, you get up to uh, 40 meters, seven to 7.3 uh, megahertz, and uh, during the day, you can get uh, about a thousand mile range, but at night you can uh, uh, jump the pond or uh, jump the Pacific. Oh, go ahead. Okay. And let's see. I don't need. That one anymore. Let's see. Okay. Now, uh, Stations. Hang on, I'm just, um, I'll be right with you. I'm just having a little issue here. Okay. Jerry, am I sharing? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. I've done. I'm, I'm done with freestyling, and I'm just going to go with the actual, the actual ARL presentation now. Um, I wanted to do it that way because I wanted to try and get those, um, those graphics, those extra graphic files out of the way because you know i we have trouble going back between uh, the different graphic files and whatnot so i kind of wanted to take all that to beginning all right let's go into it all right radio wave propagation you know when we're talking about propagation it's just that simple we're just we're simply talking about getting your radio signal from one point to the next all right it goes through the atmosphere um, and it, it, the, the way it goes depends on lots of stuff. One is, for, of course, the frequency or the wavelength, whichever. And then the other is the characteristics of the environment. And the characteristic and the way the environment affects your, your transmission depends on the frequency you're on. All right, there are three basic ways, you know, and I kind of um, broached them already. And that's line of sight, ground wave, and sky wave. Okay, now line of sight. Now this is particular for, and uh, this is why I, I had, uh, no, this is why I had stopped with the, um, or started with the uh, spectrum chart, the radio spectrum chart, is because, you know, we're going to start now talking about um, propagation and the different bands. The line of sight is the major um, transmission method for both VHF and UHF signals. Okay, so the six meter band, the two meter band, and the 70 centimeter band, or the, the 420 band, 430. Um, this is the major way. Now, as the signal goes, as it travels, uh, the signals spread out and they start losing power. And that uh, dimmun... <laughs> The decrease in power we refer to as attenuation. I don't know why they need to say attenuation rather than just you're losing power, but um, that's the way it is. Okay, line of sight, also called direct path. And this is the important transmission method 
the important propagation method for both VHF and UHF. Now, ground wave is something different. You know, the, um, the radio wave can also travel along the ground, you know, close to the earth, and it can travel further than the line of sight because, you know, to radio waves, uh, the, the curvature of the earth um, affects the radio waves and, you know, you can get quite a bit more distance. Now, ground wave, um, this doesn't apply really to VHF and UHF. Ground wave is mostly HF and is particularly strong in the in the lower frequencies so think you know the 80 meter band and, and it's it's very prominent there okay uh and bob, yeah Brad, bob uh in the in the day uh ground wave was used uh, very much by uh commercial radio stations that operated at very very low frequencies uh i remember one uh I, I don't remember it directly, but it's uh, still there. It's in uh, Sweden. Uh, it's a station that's uh, operated on 17 kilohertz. That's uh, almost within, uh, well, it's within the sound range. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only would it would the, uh, the circuit following ground wave go thousands of miles, but the characteristic of that uh, signal, it would go underwater. So submarines could pick up radio signals up to a uh, uh, hundred or so feet. But uh, <laughs> yeah. you're dead days. <laughs> yeah, and and of course those are um, very low frequency, very and they can be very very long antennas. Um, do you know it? There used to be up in the Upper Peninsula. There used to be a communication system uh, referred to as as ELF. Uh, extremely low frequency that was used by the Navy uh, to communicate specifically with submarines. Um, it's not in service anymore, but uh, but the uh, antenna, which by the way, they had buried in the ground, not in the air, it was buried in the ground. The antenna for that, and again, this is very, very low frequency, the, the antenna was two miles long. So anyhow, so that's, uh, but again, here we're talking about essentially HF, high frequency, uh, we say high, high frequency, but really it's for the radio frequencies, they're, they're lower frequencies. Okay. And then radio waves, yes, they can be conducted along surface. They can be reflected by conductive surfaces. They can be reflected off the ground. We talked about that, you know, for uh, long distance hops, multiple hops. Yes, uh, it can be reflected off the water. That's how uh, people can uh, transmit from US to Europe. You know, they can bounce off the water, off the, uh, the ocean. Um, it can also, radio waves can also be reflected by buildings, uh, buildings and other structures, uh, also natural structures for that matter, but, um, but also by buildings. Your uh, two meter signal up in the VHF range, that your signals there can be reflected along or reflected off the sides of buildings. That's a big deal. If you have a radio in your car and you're driving through a city and you're driving past buildings, um, yeah, yeah, your signal will go out, but it it will, you know, reflect off buildings. Um, refraction. Oh, refraction occurs um, when waves um, go through a different medium uh, that have different speeds for light. You know, water or electrical feed lines or things like that. That's refraction. Okay, now diffraction. This is interesting, um, and and this this kind of diffraction is uh, an issue in the two meter band, uh, particularly. Um, what happens is as the radio wave hits um, a sharp edge, 
the radio wave after that can be broken up. Now, what happens to the pattern after that is that there's going to be areas where, um, the, where the radio waves double and they become louder, but there's also going to be nulls, parts where radio waves can't be heard at all. And, and that's what you're seeing here with the little interleafing uh, white spaces. Uh, those are areas where, you know, the radio signals are, are not getting through. What can be happening there is that um, the radio signal, you know, hits the, hits the building and, and it changes, it can change the, the timing a little bit for the signal. So part of your, your signal is going at one speed and the other is going at a fraction of speed lower. And, um, and that could end up distorting your signal or in some cases, uh, completely uh, uh, blanking it out. Um, this, by the way, is called knife edge propagation. Um, it's kind of funny, but there is a specific question asking about knife edge propagation. So um, if that comes up, you remember this kind of slide here and this effect, and that is uh, the effect of it is uh, it can result in, in distorted signals. It can resort in um, something referred to as, uh, well, if you're in a moving car and this is happening, it's, it's something that can uh, be referred to as um, picket fencing. fencing. Flutter, flutter. Flutter. Okay. All right, VHF and UHF propagation. It's a, uh, the range you can get is a bit better than line of sight. Now, if you're sitting on the ground, uh, you know, the line of sight to the horizon is, you know, about three miles. If you're about uh, six feet tall, then um, you know, line of sight to the horizon is uh, somewhere, you know, five miles or a little further. Uh, but the VHF and UHF signals can go a little further than that, you know, further than than just your line of sight. And, and that's a the, the distance they can achieve by that is, is referred to as the radio horizon, which, which could be quite a bit further, okay? Uh, UHF signals, now here's, again, this is why I wanted to start with that, that radio spectrum graph, is because when you're in a building, UHF signals um, have an easier time getting out. All right, so if you have your little handheld and you're inside a building and you're on a UHF frequency, um, yeah, your signals can penetrate the building and, and get out. Uh, HF and VHF, uh, they're, um, uh, have a little more problem, okay? Now, multipath. Oh, uh, uh, no, 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 no. Okay, multipath. <laughs> what happens, you know, when your signal is being reflected, it's it's like it's being broken up. And so it can be, your signal can arrive in pieces at the other station, but it can arrive at slightly different times. And, and by slightly different, I don't mean a couple of seconds, I mean fractions of a second. But still, that, that gives you um, a distorted uh, it, it's, it, it causes distorted reception. Okay. Now picket fencing and, uh, I, I referred to this later. This is when you, when you're hearing the radio, but, uh, and you're hearing the transmission, but it's fluttering, you know, it, it comes in and out, in and out loud and soft, you know, that's, that's referred to as picket fencing. And that, that is the result of multipath propagation. And uh, the prime example of that is if you're transmitting from a moving car, you know, so your your signal is getting through, but uh, it's it can be quite distorted. Picket fencing. 
And I don't know why they think that's so such a big deal or why that term is so big rather than just saying fluttering, but um, there actually is a test question referring to picket fencing. Okay, so remember it. Okay, trophospheric propagation. Um, this is cool. This is very cool. Um, for those of you who live in the Detroit area, you know, we have uh, that station WRCJ. It's at 90.9, 90, yeah, 90.9 um, FM. Uh, they play classical music during the day, and at night they play jazz. Well, one of their, well, in fact, it's their um, disc jockey, or not disc jockey, their presenter, <laughs> their radio personality who has the morning show um, is a guy named Dave Wagner, who is also a ham. He is, uh, I think it's W8DRD, Dr. Dave. And uh, he has the morning show and also the afternoon show, which he refers, refers to as Dr. Dave's drive time elixir. But anyhow, so uh, one morning when I was still working, and this would have been probably around 2015, um, I was on my way to work on a Monday morning. And um, Dr. Dave was reporting that on the two meter band, there was an opening the night before, a trophospheric ducting uh, tropospheric propagation happening on the two meter band and hams in the Detroit area were hearing hams from Chicago, which that's about 300 miles, which is an enormous distance for VHF. But that was due to this tropospheric ducting. What happens is, you know, when there's a particular temperature inversion in the in the atmosphere where um, what is it, uh, a cold layer is on top of a warm layer, or is it the other way around, Jerry? A warm layer is on top of a cold one. A warm layer is on top of a cold one. Yeah, when a warm layer is on top of a cold one, it, it can form like a duct where your VHF signal can actually travel much, much further distances. And and like we say, you know, Detroit to Chicago is about 300 miles, and and the two meter band was was open for that. Okay, now the ionosphere. Back to the ionosphere, uh, 30 to 260 miles above the Earth. Now, what happens up there is the uh, atmosphere is quite thin, um, but um, the atoms up there can be ionized uh, by um, solar radiation. So what happens is um, the ultraviolet rays from coming in from the sun, they can, they can knock electrons out of the uh, atoms up at the atmosphere. The atmosphere, of course, is mostly nitrogen and oxygen, uh, but um, the uh, ultraviolet radiation can, can knock free some electrons. So you end up with a, with a positive uh, ion and some free electrons floating out there and and this condition this condition allows for really good <laughs> radio wave propagation okay so uh, the layers we talked about again the trophosphere uh, is the lowest layer uh, going up to about six miles the stratosphere after that up to about 30 miles and then we go, we start getting into the ionosphere layers, the D layer, the smallest one. And this is, I think, oh, this is, this is the, uh, uh, this is the uh, picture from the book. So, you know, you should, you should have this in your book, but you know, yeah, the D layer is the lowest one. The E layer, remember the, the D layer is the one that goes away at night. The E layer really, really thins out at night. And then the F1 and the F2 layer, and remember those combine at night. Um, what makes them different is the um, the uh, different amounts of ionization. You know, because because the closer you get to the Earth, the denser the atmosphere is, and you get higher up, and it's least dense, and uh, so that's why there's that difference. Okay. Oh yeah, and the um, 
the uh, solar illumination. Uh, yeah, it, you know, it's reacting to stuff from the sun. So uh, the conditions can change, you know, hour to hour, you know, based on the activity of what's going on in the sun. Uh, actually, they they have uh, you know uh, websites that will uh, describe solar weather, and uh, I well Bob's probably going to uh, go into it. Uh, uh, it can be nice and it can be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, the sunspot cycle. Yes. Now, you know the the sunspots they kick out a lot of energy. And a lot of that energy, some of it can be very, very advantageous. Some of it can be very bad, depending on um, <laughs> on how intense it is. Uh, you know, we get something like uh, there's something called a coronal mass ejection, and Ooh. that, yeah, that that can really disturb radio communications. But some level of sunspot activity is really, really good, and um, the sunspots follow an 11 year cycle. Uh, we've been, uh, you know, humans have been following it. Uh, well, you know what? I should say humans in the West have been following it since at least uh, the 1600s. Uh, in the East, they may have been following it even longer than that um, since they were civilized a lot more before we were. Um, but anyhow, so yeah, the sunspot activity follows an 11 year cycle. And the cycles vary in their activity also. Right now we are in what's called cycle 25. And this is, um, we've just started into this in uh, what, about 2021. And, um, and this is good because what happens as, as the sunspots increase as a level of activity on the sun increases, um, radio transmission gets better. Okay, so right now, um, about, oh, say, 10 years ago, five years ago, the 10 meter band was terrible. You know, there was not enough activity, not enough sunspot activity to make that very good. But right now, sunspot activity is increasing. So the 10 meter band, and remember, you have phone privileges in the 10 meter band. The 10 meter band is opening up and there's, um, there's, uh, there's guys making great contacts in long distances on the 10 meter band. Okay. Now, the ionosphere acts, yes, we've talked about that. And reflection depends on angel, how am I doing on time? I'm doing okay. All right. Yeah, now. Um, when we're talking, this is important. This this is this is important an important concept for you to know, and that is that um, yes, frequency affects you know how far your signal can travel. For the low frequencies in the HF range, their signals are going to bounce off the ionosphere with great regularity. Okay, so um, so they can communicate long, long distances, but but as you get up in frequency, as the frequency increases into the VHF range and furthermore into the UHF range, those signals do not bounce off the ionosphere. They go right through the ionosphere. They go right up into space. Now, that's really too bad if you want to communicate with Europe, you know, from America, but it's really great if you want to uh, communicate with a satellite or the International Space Station <laughs> or or if NASA wants to talk to uh, a, uh, astronauts going to the moon, you know, you need those frequencies to penetrate the atmosphere and not be bouncing around. OK. So there is a concept called uh, maximum usable frequency and maximum usable frequent frequency is just um, a frequency, a limit. It's an upper limit of what you can use to get distance. All right. So and you surpass that 
if you get above a, the maximum usable frequency, uh, what happens is your um, your radio transmission either goes right through the atmosphere or simply gets absorbed. All right, uh, Bob, can I share something? Sure, go ahead. Okay. All right, where, where to go? Go for it. <laughs> okay, go for it. All right. Um, okay, see that? Uh, oh, no, wait a minute. I have to stop sharing. Hang on. Okay. Yes, yes. Now okay. we see it. All right. Uh, there are stations all over the world that uh, shoot a signal straight up. And uh, fr from from this, they can determine the maximum usable frequency at any particular time. Our closest station is in Alpena, and it shows here uh, that the maximum usable frequency for right now is 27.7 megahertz, which means that the uh, signals will bounce all the way up to that. And uh, you might even try uh, to, you know, 28 megahertz uh, to the 10 meter band and uh, get some... Uh, get some results. So uh, there are resources that uh, you can uh, harness later on. Uh, it's a very involved map and all that. I only look at uh, particularly uh, this 27.7. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, OK. Can you put that URL in the chat? Oh, you, oh OK, let, let me Link. see. Um, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's really interesting. Also, Jerry, I was impressed that um, I looked at the date on that, and that's today's date. You got it. <laughs> Every seven minutes, they uh, sh shoot up uh, another signal and uh, pr publish a report. <laughs> okay. today. I, I, I did not know of that. Hmm. Okay. Or you, you know what? I think... As a matter of fact, you've you've said that before, and I just forgot. So, anyhow, um, the ionosphere, a radio frequency mirror. Yeah, yeah, we've talked about this. This is skip propagation, sky wave, where um, where you can get over the horizon propagation. Right, you get more than line of sight because you're reflecting it off. You're reflecting your radio wave off the uh, ionosphere. Um, now it tells you again, very rare on 140, 144 megahertz and higher. 144 megahertz is the two meter band. And it's, you know, again, I say it's the workhorse band for the technician licenses. So that's important. Yeah, skip is very, very rare. Uh, on the two meter band, you can get some trophospheric ducting uh, some tropospheric propagation, propagation, but um, not reflecting off the ionosphere. That's just, you get tropospheric ducting due to uh, temperature inversions in the lower, the lower atmosphere. Okay, and each ground to sky or ground, uh, ground to sky to ground trip is called a hop, okay? We had talked about that. Okay, and signals take many paths through the ionosphere. Sure they do. <laughs> and, but the problem with that is, is that at the receiving antenna, these signals, um, they can be reaching you at slightly different times. So they can come, you can be getting uh, a signal from several d different paths not sources, but from one source, it can come several different paths. And depending on how they arrive in time, they can either um, enhance each other or they can cancel each other out. Or <laughs> more than likely just give you very, very distorted uh, reception. Okay. Um, oh, randomly combining receiving signals, yeah. Can partially cancel out. Yeah, and that fading, uh, if you're if you're not speaking, if you're sending data instead, digital signals, 
Yeah, it can increase the number of errors. Yeah. Okay. And then sporadic E. Okay, now this is another one of those kind of things where uh, even the two meter band, but more so on the six meter and the 10 meter band, you can get times where there's just uh, high ionization in the E layer that can actually reflect, you know, higher HF signals, um, higher HF frequencies and BHF signals. Uh, you're not going to get sporadic E. This is also sometimes called E skip. And, um, but you're not going to get it at the UHF frequencies. Okay. All right. Oh, and again, we talked a little bit about the aurora. The aurora near the north and south poles can also reflect VHF and UHF waves, but they come with very distorted sounds. Okay. So VHF, particularly the six meter band and uh, also the two meter band, uh, you can play with the aurora. All right. And then there's meteor scatter. Now, now, um, I, this really takes a uh, <laughs> this really takes a ham radio maven. You know, it, it this takes some talent to do. Um, <laughs> and I can assure you, I've never done meteor scatter um, uh, transmissions. Okay, yeah, and the thing is, you don't notice, but there are thousands of meteors that hit the atmosphere every day, mostly tiny. But they do leave ionized gases. Now the the gases you can actually the ionized the ionized gases you can actually bounce radio signals off. The only thing is is that um, they don't last very long. You know, it's matters of um, chunks of seconds. Okay. Um, anyhow, reflecting off uh, meteor is referred to as meteor scatter. Uh, again, the best band for that is the six meter band, about 50 megahertz. Technician licensees have privileges in the six meter band, and you can do that. Yeah, you can you can have fun with that if that is your thing. What you'll find, there's lots of stuff you can do in ham radio, lots of stuff you can do, but you're probably not going to be interested in everything. OK, um, I've never had the patience or. Or, or particularly the interest to try meteor scatter. So, um, but it's cool that you can do it. Okay, and like they say that uh, with meteor scatter and sporadic E, you can get contacts up to uh, uh, like one and a half thousand miles, which is cool. All right. Along those along those lines, real quick, Bob, um, you were just saying you know you've never really been interested in, but. And I, I feel the same way, except when I realized I can bounce my signal off the moon. Yeah. And I yes. went, oh, now that I would like to try someday. <laughs> and so that's on my that's on my list to someday try to bounce off the moon. Oh, yeah. Now, to, to bounce off the moon, you're going to need some power, and you're going to yep. need a, a directional antenna. But, uh, yeah, you know, there's people in our club that have, that have done that. And uh, uh, that's, that's something I'd like to see someone do. So, um, okay. You know what? We're at, what, about seven minutes to nine at this point. I think that's as far as I'm going to go for tonight. Um, I, I think that's enough. I'll, I'll, uh, Jerry, I'm going to have to take part of next session uh, to finish up chapter four. Okay. Because I have to go through antennas and feed lines. But, um, but I think for tonight, that's probably enough. Uh, yeah, they've gotten a good dose of little... stuff to, uh, to swallow. They let got me, a good let me dose add one of stuff. Little quick thing, if you don't mind, Bob. I'm sorry. Let me add one little quick thing, if you don't mind. Oh, Mike, go ahead. Just uh, you know, putting some of this into uh, into play. When you're on 
two meter or 70 centimeter, keeping in mind that the signal is called two meter because it's, you know, the signal is two meters wide, roughly, or 70 centimeters wide. Now, why I'm do talking about this is because I, you're, you're on your little handheld radio and you're talking to somebody. Maybe you're checking into a net. Maybe you're just talking to somebody and they're saying, gee, you're just not coming through really clear right now. Since that wave is only this, you know, two meters wide, if you move five feet, you can have a completely different amount of signal going out. So keep that in mind when you're on your on your on your radio, especially on a little handheld, it's really easy to move. Um, if your signal isn't great, just move a little bit. Find a different part of your house or your yard and just move five feet, move 15 feet. And that can make all the difference in the world on you getting a really clear signal out. Yeah. Um, yeah, because what Mike's talking about is, you know, two meters, that's like 68 inches. Um, and a half a wavelength at two meters is what thirty nine inches. So yeah, if if you're standing up and take two steps to the left, you've moved over half a wavelength. You take three or four steps left, you've moved a wavelength, and um, and, and that can have a significant effect on your <laughs> on your um, transmission. Yes, well, I guess uh, we're we're going to talk about that more next time. Uh, when we get into uh, antennas, but yeah, that's that's just cool. You know, the the funny thing is, like, uh, we have this one uh, ham that calls into our net and, on Sunday night, and it's a two meter net. So, oh well, actually, this is not dealing with wavelength. This is polarization. <laughs> but uh, well, you know what? I'll talk about that next time. It's a funny story, though. Okay. But that's enough for tonight, uh, especially since part of what you had tonight was was from chapter three. Chapter three is the toughest chapter. Uh, that's the chapter Jerry had. That's the the toughest chapter in the book. So like everything else after that Maybe. is easy sledding. Well, easier sledding. So uh, <laughs> and since it's the tougher chapter, that's that's why we stick Jerry with it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay. A spooky bear hat and become your drill instructor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Students, if oh, you yeah. haven't started yet, you should be doing ham exam, ham practice exams. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, as often as you like, you can do them every day. You can do them every hour. You can do them however often you like. But, you know, as we've said a million times, well, maybe not a million, not that I ever exaggerated at all. Um, you know, our our goal in this class is not to teach you everything about ham radio, but to get you to pass the technician class license exam. And so part of that is encouraging you to do those practice practice exams. They are, you know, it's it's free, it's easy, and they will help you immensely. Okay. okay. For uh, for uh, everyone's information, uh, when I talked about that ionogram thing, uh, it said twenty seven point something megahertz. So I figured uh, let let me try twenty eight megahertz. And I just heard a, uh, a station in Washington State. So uh, yeah, there is a little bouncing off there. All right, uh, Kim, did you have your uh, hand up for anything? Yeah, I had a question. Um, I missed the first class, so I'm guessing this was covered then, <laughs> but. When is the exam? Is it on specific dates or, you know, how do uh, they do this? You know, uh, the club has an exam. Okay. Of, it, the closest uh, to, to uh, that would be uh, uh, December, the first uh, Tuesday in de December. Uh, but I, I was thinking of possibly uh, 
arranging to get a uh, room at, at uh, the Southfield Rec Center. I, I think they can do that for us, and we can uh, get enough uh, uh, volunteer examiners to uh, do it at the uh, at the last class session. How would that work? Bob, what do you think? Yeah, I'd, I'd show up. Yeah. Okay. Well, will, we can get enough uh, examiners, and we can uh, do it right then. I will tell so you that November 9th. Uh, you think November 9th will work, uh, Bob, or the, the week after? Uh, November 9th is, uh, I think our last class is going to be probably end up being uh, November 2nd. So November 9th would be. Um, it's actually published. I was just looking at it published as November 9th. November 9th. Yeah. So what I was wondering is I know that the one Jerry went over, um, that's going to take a lot for me to understand. Part of me was looking at those one day classes um mm -hmm. and um seeing if i don't you know the the only ones i saw were um i think in october i was thinking i might take you know do some practicing take one of those and then take the test so <laughs> yeah. no, Katie, so, so, and if you're doing it. the press practice exams just you know you're you're probably not going to be passing them right now um, right that's okay Right. Um, when you're getting regularly getting, you know, 80, 85 percent, you're ready. OK, OK. Uh, the the Hammer One Day class is a good service, but it, it is pretty stressful. Yeah, well, I I realized that I almost thought about taking it last year and the instructor said, no, if you haven't done the studying, don't do it <laughs> so mm -hmm. um but i thought now that i've gone through that it might be a nice refresher for me um after i go through this class so um that's that's what i was thinking so i don't know if i'm going to be ready november 9th um okay. we'll see i suddenly came up with a project for work that's going to take a lot of my time um okay. until yeah. october 18th so so we'll I'll see, <laughs> you know, I would be nice. It would be nice to have it by then. Yeah. But, and the Hazel Park Amateur Radio Club does do classes um, every other month. I'm not classes, testing. Okay. Every other month. Okay. And we, um, we could, we could put in, put you uh, contact in contact with uh, people who do uh, online testing. Okay. Yep. There's that too. So, so uh, yeah. But if you're, if you're not ready on November 9th, then, um, you know, we're going to have a test on uh, December da, 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 5th. December 5th. So, yeah. And, so, and at the Oak Park, Park. At sounds the Oak Park like, community. sounds like there are a lot of options. So yes. I am just kind of getting my head around when, when I'll be able to do that or when is realistic for me. So, yeah. okay. Thanks. Well, very good, everyone. Thank you for showing up. Aloha. <laughs>